So this young woman rushes home after she's had a date with uh, her fella, and she's crying, and she's hysterical, and her mother says, what's the matter? What's the matter? And she says, he asked me to marry him. And she said, well, I don't understand. What's wrong with that? He's a good guy. He treats you well. He loves you. He's a kind person. He's got a good job. What, what, I don't understand. What, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she says, well, it's, it's a question of faith. He doesn't believe in hell. <laughs> and um, the mother said, you know, he's a really good guy. Marry him anyway, and I'm sure between the two of us, we can convince him. Look, a woman sent that to me, okay, so you take it up with her. All right, so my topic this morning is immerse yourself. And, and the immersion that I'm talking about is uh, for us as students of the science of mind to immerse ourselves in a God consciousness. Ernest Holmes used to tell all of his ministers that our message is very simple. This is it. God is all there is. Now you figure out a different way to say that 52 Sundays a year. And so, you know, the, the idea of immersing ourselves, immersing ourselves in a different kind of thinking, a different kind of believing, a different awareness than what we have had is what will make an enormous difference in our life. Because, you know, what you'll notice is that the media is always pounding us with information. The world around us is always telling us, you know, you got to do something out here to make things better, for you to be okay, for you to be lovable, for you to look good. Change something out here. And, you know, humanly, how I see that we translate that is that we keep doing what we've always done trying to get a different result. We just think, you know, I just got to keep doing what I'm doing and do it a little harder. That's what I've got to do. I've just got to be more disciplined and have more willpower and keep doing what I've been doing. And if I just do it with a little more effort, that's the thing that's going to make the difference. It will not. It will not. Einstein said you cannot ch change a problem at the level of consciousness that created it. And see, so if, if the problem in our life is, out, is something that we see out here, changing it out here is not the thing, that we have to come back to in here. And the in here is to establish a God consciousness that we are absolutely immersed in again and again throughout the day. How would we do that? Well, there was a writer, Joel Goldsmith, a metaphysical spiritual writer who was a contemporary of Ernest Holmes. They were working at a very similar time. And Joel said that what we have to do is that we have to stop several times a day. So I'm going to make the recipe plain, three times a day. Three times a day, we stop, we close our eyes, we become still, and you might say to yourself silently, God is all there is, God is all there is, or love is all there is, peace is all there is. Right? And you just breathe. At some point, a minute, maybe two minutes into it, you will take a big, deep breath. Do you know, what, you know can we all recognize this? You just sort of go, he says, at that moment, you've made contact. You have contacted the presence, the principle, the power. And then you take another breath or two and open your eyes and move on with your day. That it's that simple. It doesn't have to be a big deal. You know, people always think, oh, meditating, I just don't have the time. I can't sit for an hour. You don't have to sit for an hour. If I asked you to do that, I know that nobody would do it because we're busy people. But we can stop for two or three minutes three times a day. No, and just breathe and remember God is all there is. God is all there is in this situation, in and through all people, in and through my body. God is all there is. And you'll have that big changed breath. You've established contact. Take another breath or two and then open your eyes and go about your day. See, this is the consciousness that we're talking about immersing ourselves in. So in, um, in the Bible, we read of Jesus starting his public ministry after being immersed in the River Jordan with John the Baptist. And it says the Holy Spirit came upon him, he went into the desert for 40 days, and then he started his public ministry. So he was changed by that immersion experience. His consciousness was different when he came up out of the water. Now, an interesting thing about in ancient times when they baptized, they held you underwater. It wasn't this pretty little sprinkling, you know, like you're misting an orchid with a spritzer, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. They, you know, because you were supposed to have a new life when you came up out of that water. 
So picture this, that John the Baptist holds you under and holds you and holds you. And when you come up, what kind of a breath do you take? <sighs> it's a whole new life starting right then. Starting right then. So when we establish contact with the principal power and presence of God that's within us, yes, it's everywhere, but the part of it that we get to know is right here where we are. It's like we have a new life from that point on. So there's a, a writer I like, Anne, Anne Lamott, and she says that there are really three categories of prayer. And they, they go like this, that all prayers sort of fit into these three categories. Help, thanks, and wow. <laughs> and so if you think about it, you see, well, there's, there's a lot of sense in that, that we all understand the help prayer. We all understand the prayers for help, where we speak our word and we give a treatment and, and you know, the important thing for us to remember as metaphysical spiritual students is that because we pray, because we treat, God does not do anything different, we do. You know, our thinking changes. We start to get rewired on the inside so that we're bringing something different to the occasion of our life that we see as an opportunity for healing. So um, help, thanks, we all understand. It's in its, you know, there's nothing like prayers of gratitude. And sometimes, you know, one of the greatest prayers you can pray is to give thanks before receiving. You know, to pray a prayer of gratitude before you receive, you know, is a very, very powerful thing. This is what Jesus said. He said, thank you, Father, I know you hear me always. All right, so sometimes we haven't had the healing yet. We haven't had the demonstration yet. But we're not begging God. We're thanking God in what looks like in advance sometimes. You know, but we understand that this is principally based, that there's a spiritual principle here, that gratitude is the anointing of increase, that what you're grateful for, the universe gives you more of. Help, thanks, and wow. Wow. There's a lot of wow out there. If we have the eyes to see it, isn't there? There is a lot of wow that we should be so, so like, wow, God is awesome. Look at that. Look at that. You know, I've, I mean, everybody's had this happen, but... It wows me when I see it. I'm walking my dogs down the street, and there's nothing but cement. And all of a sudden, there's like this little bit of green and a flower. And I think, life, down deep, under the cement, said, I'm here to express abundantly. And it pushes up and up and up until it cracks through the cement. Cracks through the cement and says, ah, here I am. God, it's great to be alive, isn't it? It is just great to be alive. And I think, God, so many times I feel like I'm under the cement. I'm under the cement, and I'm thinking, if somebody would just come and crack the cement, if somebody would just come and crack the cement, I just know I could shine. I know I could thrive. But you know, that's the seed's job. The seed has within it the ability to press through whatever the seeming obstacle is so that it might express life in a greater way. That's us. Help. Thanks. Wow. So there's a character in the Old Testament in 2 Kings, and um, his name is Naaman. So you know when you play those games to remember somebody's name? So I've always remembered him as Naaman, uh, Raman, like the noodle. And so I always think, oh, that guy in 2 Kings, Noodle, Noodle. And it's like, no, 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 is it Noodle? No, Noodle is Raman, and Raman stands for Naaman. So there's a guy in 2 Kings, and his name is Naaman, okay? <laughs> but the, but, so anyway, he, um, he is favored by the Syrian king. He's done really great military stuff, and he's gotten all these awards and accolades and whatnot, and... And the problem is he has leprosy. So he goes to the Syrian king and he says, um, uh, a handmaid of my wife has said that there is a great prophet in Israel who could heal me. Could you give me an introduction as one king to another? And so I would go to Israel and go to the king there with a letter from you and maybe he would let his prophet heal me. And so the king because Naaman is so favored, is happy to do this for him. And so he writes the letter, you know, the letter of introduction, dear king of Israel, please take care of my servant, 
ramen, namen, namen, sorry, just, just, <laughs> God, I did it again. And uh, see, that's the problem when you play those little name things to remember, right? <laughs> and um, please, you know, heal him. And he sends with Naaman, he sends gold and silver and beautiful clothes so, so that the king will do this. And so he gets there and the king of Israel says, you know, I can't heal you. I'm just a man. I, I can't do it. But the prophet hears of his being there and he sends word. And he says, send him to me and I will heal him. So Naaman goes to like the prophet's house, but the prophet doesn't even come out. And this really fries his bacon. He gets really worked up. I mean, he's a big to-do in Syria. And here, the prophet in Israel can't even come out of the house and speak to him face to face. He sends a servant out with a message. And the message is, bathe seven times in the River Jordan and you'll be healed. And he says, well, that, that, there's nothing auspicious about that. We have great rivers in Syria. Forget it. I'm not going to do it. You know, he, couldn't, he didn't think enough of me to come out and greet me face to face. And so one of his uh, underlings, one of his assistants says, look, we came all this way. Why don't you just do what the prophet says and see what happens? But just, just do it. See what happens. Mm -hmm. So back to the immersion. It's very difficult for us to surrender our ego to have healing isn't it? Because we just know what we know. And we know what we know with such conviction. But sometimes we know what we know with such conviction, and it doesn't serve us. Right? And so he decides, all right, I'll do it. So he goes to the River Jordan. He bathes seven times. And when he comes up the last time, he has this extraordinary healing, and he no longer has leprosy. Like, wow, that's amazing. That's terrific. So he's about to go back. Oh, we, oh, so he offers the prophet the silver and the gold, and the, gold. the prophet wants none of it. See, this is the thing. The prophet knows that God is the source. The prophet knows that God is the principle and the power and the presence. So he knows, I didn't do anything. Don't give me the gold and the silver and the beautiful clothes. No, no, wants no part of it. But there's an assistant who, like, like the assistant minister, it would be Reverend Mark. Good thing he's not in the sanctuary, you know? <laughs> I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing. But the assistant says, hey, you know, <laughs> if you're going to give that stuff away, I could really use a little gold, a little silver, some nice clothes. So he gives him some, and what happens is he instantly becomes leprous himself. Right? So the point, I think, of the story is that he was relying on his good as being sourced from the world out here. When he thought his good came from out here, he got in trouble. And that's really like all of us, you know, to know the distinction between there are lots of avenues in the world through which my good comes to me. But the source, the source is always God. I will tell you, as the minister of this church, it is so tempting for me to think that the congregation is the source of our good. You know, and, and that's a real trap. That's a real trap. So part of my practice every day is I have to say, you know, I know that God is the only source of good in the life of our church. You know, and the congregation is often a wonderful, wonderful avenue through which the good of God flows. But I have to know that God's the source, because what happens when the congregation changes? I mean, what happens when you go on location for a movie? Has the source of our good left? Right? What happens when you meet somebody and move to Florida? <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. You know? <laughs> so... So here's another thing that I think is very relevant with this idea of being immersed in a God consciousness. That people, we all do this, we look out here and we think the power is out here in the world, in anything. We think the power is in whatever is going on here. And this is what the media would have us believe, that there are always things out here to be afraid of. There are always things out here um, that are going to make us more fearful or more doubting or, or, or that, that are going to make us not safe and things happening out here that are going to make us feel insecure. That does seem to be the job of the media, I understand, okay? But I also know that if we perpetuate that, that lots of people here have children, you have grandchildren, we all have nieces and nephews, that that is not going to add to the world in a way that's going to serve those generations. It's not helpful. It's not constructive. It's not life-affirming. You know, 
welcome new babies into the world. Boy, should you be scared. Holy cow, I'd go back now if I were you. <laughs> you know, it's just not helpful. It's not going to create a world that, that, that they're going to want to, to live in. It's not going to create a wonderful, safe, loving environment. You know, every generation is supposed to go beyond the generation that comes before it. You know, but in order to do that, we have to set them up to win. You know, we have to set them up with a consciousness of, and it gets to be better, and it gets to be healed, and our past does not have to dictate our future. So, you know, one of the ways that I see people give something external all the power is around food, okay? So let me talk about this, because food and I are very close, <laughs> and we have been for a long time. But people will have something... And then they'll say, oh my God, I shouldn't eat this. Oh my gosh, I look at this and it makes me fat. Oh my God, this is so bad for me. I'm going to eat it anyway. Then I'm going to be filled with self-loathing for the next 48 hours, blah, blah, blah. And it just goes on and on and on. So first of all, first of all, just stop. <laughs> just stop it, okay? If you're going to eat it, shut up and eat it, okay? <laughs> But please don't go on about it, because nobody wants to hear that. You're ruining it for them, OK? So if you look at cake and it makes you fat, well, then work on your consciousness so it doesn't. But don't ruin my cake, OK? I think cake is a sacrament, OK? I mean, think about it. Fondant, ganache, marzipan, buttercream. Oh my god, it's all god. It's beautiful. It's good, right? So what to do? What to do? How to handle this differently? Emma says, if you think something is bad for you, it will be. It's done unto you as you believe. So if you're going to eat something, rather than go, oh my god, I shouldn't eat this. Oh my god, it's going to make me so fat. Oh my god, this is terrible for me. Oh my god, it's going to keep me up all night. Oh my god, shut up. <laughs> Emma says, look at it, and if your belief about it is this is not good for me, forgive it. Forgive it. And then eat it. So, you take that hot, crispy, well-salted French fry that's just come out of the oil and you drag it through your ketchup with Tabasco sauce mixed in, and you look at it and you say, I forgive you. Ah. Okay? I'm telling you, this works. This works, because you know what you're doing is that it's giving you a moment to pause and become really conscious about what you're putting in, you know? People are always, always concerned, you know, all right. So here's one of these things, this is where I really get myself in trouble. But you know, er so here's the thing. Ernest said, you should not be so concerned about what goes in your mouth as what comes out of your mouth. That has a bigger impact on your life, you know? So, just a point of reference, Hitler was a vegetarian, Jesus was not. Okay? So, I'm going to Brazil tomorrow, so you can give all the heat from that to Reverend Mark. Okay? Now, let me say this about Brazil, because people have asked, why are you going to Brazil? I don't understand, why are you going to Brazil? Look, I've been to lots of holy, sacred places all over the globe. I've been to lots of them. And and this is different. I'm here to tell you this is different. Not that it's better, it's just different. In that way that places are different, the energy is different. And so this is a wonderful experience. We're, uh, Diana Donaldson and I, we're taking a group from church here for people to immerse themselves in a spiritual consciousness. And so people have said to me, well, couldn't you just do that here if you were really spiritual? And I said, yes, you could if you were really spiritual. Because you know what would happen, though? If you stayed home and said, I'm going to spend two weeks just devoting myself to being immersed in God consciousness, I'm going to ring bells and light incense, and I'm going to, I don't know, put crystals on my body and do all kinds of spiritual voodoo like that. You know, look, I'm in favor of everything. If it, you know, if, if it helps you and it doesn't hurt anybody, I'm totally in favor of it. And if at the end I even look a little better, I'm totally on board, okay? <laughs> but the thing is, if you stayed home to do that, you know what would happen? The phone would ring. 
people would knock on your door and they'd say, I know you're supposed to be on spiritual retreat and you're trying to develop a God, a God consciousness so you could have healing in your life, but could I really borrow your hedge trimmers? I need them very badly. You know, oh, I'm sorry, I know you're trying to be in prayer all day long and be awake and focus on forgiveness and love and putting peaceful vibrations out into the universe, but you know, do, do, do you have a cup of sugar I could have? Or can I tell you about my problem? You know, and so, you know, your whole spiritual immersion goes out the window. So this is why we lift up and go someplace else and plant ourselves down so that all people have to focus on. Their room is handled, their food is handled. All they have to do is focus on healing. That's why we go. Right? And so, interestingly enough, as we've all experienced, that sometimes, before you can have healing in one area of your life, you have to have healing in another area. So you could go with the idea of, I want to have physical healing, but it may be that something mental or emotional and certainly spiritual might need to be healed first before physical healing can happen. And I believe that's just how it works here as well. You know, Ernest Holmes says that we have to have conscious and subjective agreement that our conscious mind and our subjective, mind, our subjective mind have to be in perfect harmony for there to be a demonstration. And so part of how we do that, part of how we achieve that, is that we immerse ourselves in a God consciousness. God is all there is. Three times a day this week, three times a day, for two or three minutes, you close our eyes. And we say to ourselves silently over and over again, God is all there is, God is all there is, or love is all there is, love is all there is. And at some point, you'll notice you, your breath changes. You have a big... <sighs> That's it. You've established contact with the principal power and presence of God within you. You're connected. Now, take another breath or two, open your eyes, and go out and live your life. And take that consciousness with you. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now, recognizing that we are surrounded and filled with God's spirit, God's love, God's truth, that the very presence, the very principle, the very power of life itself is right here, expressing in us and through us, around us. I know that God is all there is, and this is the truth about each and every one of us. It could be no other way. And so I claim for us today that we are immersed in the consciousness of God, the consciousness of God's love, of God's peace, of God's creativity, of God's abundance. We live and we move and we have our being in this expanded God consciousness. And I know that everything that would serve our life, that would serve our greater good, our greater healing, is on the way right now. And we are open, willing vessels to receive it. I speak this word for each and every one of us, that if there is something in our thinking something in our history that does not serve us, that limits us, holds us back, keeps us small. I speak the word that we willingly surrender that right now. We release it, knowing that no good comes from it, that the good of God for each and every one of us is infinite, and we welcome that forward in our life, in our minds, in our bodies, in all of our relationships. So all those things in the world around us that would make us fearful, that make us feel small and insignificant and separate and at effect, for all of that, we return again to the truth that God is all there is. And that even in the midst of these appearances, God is fully present. The one life, the one light, the one love is right there. We let our prayer be a blessing in the lives of all of our family members, our parents and grandparents, our children, our aunts and uncles, just everybody we love and care about, our friends. We let this word be the healing activity that reveals more God, more love, more truth in all lives. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples. We bless mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we all get raised up. We all get lifted by being together in consciousness. Our faith is increased. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.